Tonight, we're gonna to talk about together creating life-changing smiles. It's been often said that uh, when you meet someone that the smile is the first thing that you recognize. And it's true, especially us as dentists. Uh, my wife and I sometimes were going over to someone's house pre-COVID. We would always play a little game. She goes, when you meet new people at, if we're going to a dinner or a party, don't stare at their teeth the first thing. We can't help it. That's it. That's what we do. So tonight we're going to take a, about an hour and 45 minutes and I'm going to try to condense and hopefully you'll get some pearls out of this and condense sometimes an all day course, sometimes two day course on creating life changing smiles. So let's get started. So I want to first of all uh, give a thank you very much out to those during this uh, pandemic. We're still going through it, but we're starting to understand a whole lot more. We're all hopefully back to work as we took uh, a few months off about a year ago. But we just, you know, still thank those people, the grocery stores, the hospital people, the dentists that we as dentists, and just thank everyone who has made it through this. And, you know, and, and we, our thoughts always goes out to those families that have lost loved ones during this terrible, terrible pandemic. So this is my email address and my phone number. I mean this, please do not hesitate to call me or email me if you have any questions or if there's something you wanna discuss because I love this, I absolutely do. Um, I really enjoy this because we both learn. There's a lot of things that you can teach me, I'm sure. And I'm always open to learn more and more. So, but this is where I live. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. And the reason I show this, my wife took this about a year, year, year ago. She uh, hikes it a lot. And this is a Red Rock Canyon for those that have been to Vegas. The reason I show this is because uh, not everybody, and, and when I'm doing a lecture live, which I am tomorrow, by the way, I'm in Seattle right now. But when I do a lecture live, uh, I, a lot of people think people that live in Las Vegas, everyone lives on the strip. It's amazing how many questions. This is about 40 minutes from our house. It's Mount Charleston and the love for these uh, horses I these are the wild Mustangs that you can see when you go up there, we take rides. And this is how the strip is usually, how we've seen it uh, all my life over the years. And a year ago, May, my wife and I took a ride and took a picture of uh, one of, from one of the walkovers and uh, no one there. So it's starting to come back. Uh, this is our favorite place to hang out. This is in Napa, these are Merlot grapes. We lo absolutely love it there. And uh, growing up in a restaurant, my parents owned one of the largest Italian restaurants in Southeast Michigan. I still, this is Super Bowl Sunday, uh, usually not this past year, but we do the cooking, we get everyone together, we have fun and we put on an Italian feast. We make this all from start there. You see uh, brujol in the upper left in the gravy, meatballs, stuffed shells and homemade pizza. So I carry it on. And of course you gotta have the cannolis. So. Let's get started. As a disclaimer, as a Catapult member, we participate in multiple product reviews each year. And it's in order to stay in the forefront of the latest materials and techniques, we test these materials for these companies and we give them our honest opinion about, you know, improvements, how they work, uh, our, where we use them in our routine every day. So this is a disclaimer. I do not get anything. Uh, I'm not paid anything for using these materials. I, they, I am supported tonight by 3M Oral Care and Perio Protect. But uh, we have, we as Catapult members, we have this disclaimer and we work with many companies. So as I mentioned tonight, I'm sponsored by 3M Oral Care and Perio Protect, which we're gonna talk about. And this is a group of companies that we routinely work with as uh, Catapult members. So, so tonight's goals, uh, principles of patient selection, six aspects of occlusion, communication with laboratory technicians, 10 rules of smile design, process of temporization, and principles of adhesion. And I will show you some different cases and scenarios we'll go through. So as uh, Albert Einstein said, we don't think, need to think more. We just need to think differently. So many times we as dentists have been trained to think within the box. But over the years, as products, materials, and the dental manufacturers have 
given us the opportunity to expand our horizons, what we can do for patients, uh, we've had to think different. And that's what I always try to share with everyone. Let's not think inside the box. Let's think outside the box and perhaps try something new. So in dentistry, we have a couple of opportunities that we can uh, do for patients. One is obviously to maintain their oral health, which contributes to their systemic health. And also we can make an emotional difference. And this is the biggest thing that I've seen over my professional career. I will tell you that I am in my 41st year in another month, I will enter my 42nd year in dentistry. And I cannot believe how much fun I am having at this time. And I mean that it is so much fun. I tried to retire and couldn't do it. I practice in Chicago, Illinois with uh, Dr. Lou Graham. I sold my practice in Vegas. I still live there and we have a summer home in Michigan, but I fly back and forth two weeks on, two weeks off. Again, I tried to quit and I couldn't because I just love what we do. I just love people. I love being able to uh, see those smiling faces. So when we do a smile makeover, the emotional difference is unbelievable. Yes, you will have patients cry right in your chair. And you will also, I will tell you that it gets, becomes very emotional when how happy you can make them. So the key to any case acceptance is the patient perceives the values and benefits of the treatment. I share this with dentists in uh, many different lectures that I present. If you tell a patient what they need, they will not perceive that value. And also you will own that dentistry. If you, if the patient wants what you have to offer, they own the dentistry. The truth of the matter is, unless there's infection involved, and I always kiddingly, but somewhat seriously share this, is everything that we do as dentists, unless infections involved, is elective because people can live without teeth. Now that's a little drastic, but that's the truth. So when you start presenting treatment and asking the patient, what it is that they want and not tell them what they want, then you as a dentist will really enjoy what you do. So I just want to share one emotional change in a patient that I worked on many years ago. This is Shauna. We're still good friends. This Shauna came to me. She raised her and her husband raised six children. She came in and said, I do not care for my teeth. I do not care for my smile. We raised six children, they're out of college now and it's time for me. And you often may hear that. Well, you can see here at Shauna's left side, she has a broken post and, and, and you can see that obviously her occlusion is an issue. She's broken off uh, porcelain off PFMs. This is Shauna from here to here. And this is 12 years. And this is a full mouth reconstruction. It's not just a smile makeover. But the reason I show this is because this is Shauna when we started. Now watch this transition. This is Shauna as we're going through her full mouth reconstruction. This actually took me about 16 months from start to finish. And this is Shauna when we were done. So not only does a smile change a person's life just from happiness and appearance, but it also changes their life from a health point of view. And she got so much into the smile change that she lost a lot of weight. She exercised and became very healthy. This is another situation where Tom, he presented this and we went this. So your practice needs to offer an experience, not just a crown. So, 94% of Americans polled said they notice a person's smile during a first encounter. People are less likely to notice your eyes or body. Just what we talked about, what my wife always said to me, try not to look at their teeth. But the fact is, in a poll, 94%, they notice their smile. And we know what a smile can do if you're going for a job interview or every day. I always say a smile from person to person is just the silence of saying, how are you? So one of the most important things on a smile makeover, and again, due to the time, usually in an all day course, we'll go through the uh, patient initial exam, comprehensive exam, but it is so important 
that you have an interview and a comprehensive exam. They're absolutely a must. The reason I say that is because some of the smile makeovers I've had to redo for dentists is because they did not listen to the patient. They did not hear what the patient says. So when we do a new patient, every new patient I have, every new patient, I do just a 10 minute interview asking them, what are their desires? Do they have any concerns? Do, are they any pain or discomfort? Is there anything they would like to change about their smile, their teeth? Is there anything systemically bothering them? Because we want to find out exactly what the patient's wants and needs are. Again, we don't want to tell them, and obviously we have to tell them our findings from the exam, but we also want to find out from the patient, what are your wants and your needs? So this is the, uh, when we go through a comprehensive exam, we use digital x-rays, we use fluorescence to detect for decay. We use transillumination. And we take digital records. We use a scanner. And in our office, we have pretty much eliminated FMX as full mouse. We take vertical bite wings and we take cone beams. And that's actually the course I'm presenting here tomorrow uh, in Seattle is how to do a comprehensive exam and work a patient up. Because what you can see for cone beam with the same, if not less radiation, what we have available to us versus a 2D x-ray, it's just a difference of night and day. And if you don't have a cone beam in your office, I wanna encourage you at least put that down to obtain a cone beam because what you can detect and what you can treatment plan will more than pay for that cone beam. So this would be the results of a comprehensive exam. And then I'm ready to share with the patient and do my clinical exam. I have a scan up in the upper right. I have vertical bite wings in the lower right. And then I have a CBCT, as you can see here. Now I am set to go. So after the interview, my assistant will take a CBCT as she's getting the scan and also the vertical bite wings. I'm reviewing that CBCT. Sometimes, and I have a Prexion, sometimes CBCT, sometimes dentists will say, well, what if there's something on there that you don't quite, you're not sure of? It is not unusual if there's something in question that we send this into a oral radiologist, uh, such as beam readers, to have it read. But I will use this in my diagnosis and have the 3D skull right there in the three views and you know, we can actually absolutely screen for sleep apnea, everything from TMJ, et cetera, to um, canals unfilled, fractured teeth. So you, it is when we say comprehensive, we mean comprehensive. So we review the comprehensive exam and we present it to the patients and their findings. So once the comprehensive exam is done, we want to, we discuss with the patient uh, they have told us that they would like a smile makeover. From our interview, we've asked them, is there anything different? Do you know this is possible? You would be surprised how many patients that there are out there that would like a smile makeover, but yet they're afraid to ask. So please take the time. In our office, and I've made this a rule for 25 plus years, the patient, new patient, when they come in, they don't just see the hygienist first, they see me as their dentist first. Yes, I do the comprehensive exam first and we try to coordinate that with a hygiene appointment if possible, but they see me first because I wanna start building that relationship. I wanna start building that trust for our office. And that's how we do that is by meeting that patient first, making it different than perhaps any other dental office in doing their interview they start trusting you. They really start trusting you. So we're planning to smile. And there's a saying that I have is that patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So in planning the smile, it's very important that you have proper, the key to the success in smile design is proper patient selection. We're going to talk about that. Listening to the patient. What is it the patient is trying to get? What is it what are their wants and needs? And a lot of the times they don't know. And you have to be absolutely 
plan this out careful. So many times I've seen where dentists just quickly go and they just start prepping teeth. Please don't do that. Plan your smile. And I'm going to give you a roadmap to use tonight that, you know, we want a structured systemic approach, a roadmap so that you make sure along the way that you're not contributing to any problems that they may have already. You know, you don't want to contribute. I call, for instance, malocclusion, bruxing, grinding, clenching. Perhaps they have GERD. Perhaps they have sleep apnea. I want to make sure those are all pre-screened ahead of time. Perhaps they need some myofunctional therapy. Perhaps they have TMJ issues. We don't want anything we do in dentistry. If it's just even a filling, think about what you're doing. Are you contributing to the pathology or are you trying to solve the root of the issue before you go on? Remember, in most cases, smile design is an elective procedure. So again, find out what the patient wants first. If they can't express it, which a lot of them can, then we utilize some tools such as a smile catalog showing previous cases or a smile style guide. And I'll show you what that is. Helps the patient communicate what they do or do not like. So I show photos, previous cases. I show photos in a smile catalog. I show, show smiles in the smile style guide. So these are some photos I may show patients. And what I do a lot of times is I do literally a keynote or a PowerPoint workup where I'll take their pictures and I'll just image over them, kind of just like a digital imaging. And I'll show them that that is possible. This is a previous case that is very similar to theirs, but I will show them photos of what we have. I, if it's a male, I'll show them male photos. If it's a female, I'll show them females. And then we'll talk about the shade, okay? What color is it they want? Because that's usually one of the top questions is, I want to whiten my teeth. Now, one of the things I've had to go through is in Las Vegas, my, I was very blessed in my practice. My name got out. And I happened to had the opportunity to do a lot of the smile makeovers for a lot of the entertainers. And in Vegas, people want white. Well, when I started practicing, and I did practice 26 years in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but when I went back to the Midwest and in Chicago, it's not like it is in Vegas. Not everybody wants white. So we go to more of a natural blend. And when you do this, take your time with this, because a lot of times the shapes and the shades of the teeth is what makes a case or breaks a case. So again, give the patient what they want. And the nice thing about it, when you see how we do our temporaries, if they can't tell you what they want for color or shade, then we can work that out in the temporaries. And I'll show you about, show you that when we get to that point. So this is a smile style guide. Now, unfortunately, uh, I know one of the authors very well, Lauren, that produced this. They stopped making this book. And believe me, this is an incredible book uh, because it helps you describe not only the shapes of the teeth and incisal edge positions and corners and embrasures, facial embrasures, textures. This book has it all. But also it shows different shades, again, different shapes. And it allows the patient just to sit there just like a magazine as if they were sitting in their home and go through this. And I'll sit down and take time and I'll show the patient, point out, these are the contact areas. This is more of a feminine smile. This is more of a masculine smile. This is the texture on the teeth. Do you want to have you know, uh, different types of textures? Do you wanna have different shapes? So we'll discuss this. Do you wanna have different anatomical features on your teeth? So we'll discuss this with them and give them an idea to help them start think, thinking. So I let them know that, uh, the size and length and position of teeth are determined using knowledge of anatomy and function. And I'll help them decide on that. I will be the one to decide that with my lab technician. Other features such as tooth color and shape can be chosen by the patient. So we talk about that and we discuss this. So as you can already see, I put a lot of time, we should all put a lot of time in discussing this with the patient. 
It's just not a quick decision because you will have unhappy patients. I always say to doctors and I always say to patients, hey, you're leaving the office. Uh, you have a, we love your smile. You love your smile, but it does have my name across it. If you want further referrals in everything you do, you will make sure that patient's happy. Have I had to do a smile over? I have. Not many, but I have just to make that patient happy. And sometimes that's difficult. We all realize that. So this is part, part of the smile style. And you can see here the photos where the patient can compare the difference of different types of designs. And we just go through this with them, pointing out different smiles, different angles. So there is a way, and I'm gonna share it with you in a minute, how to get the digital. So Lauren and David Trout, Lauren Berlin, who I know, Lauren, David Trout, they designed this, but I believe it's still available. And I'm not sure if this is the phone number anymore, but the last time I checked it was, if you write this down to digident.com, it is available in the digital form, which nowadays we're all digital. Uh, and this will help in sharing that opportunity with your patient. So again, if you need that at some spot, at some time, you, I will give you my email and phone number. Uh, I can shoot you an email back and um, I'll get that to you. So digital smile design has become very, very popular since uh, Christian Coachman, Dr. Coachman came out, he was the popular person. But a lot of your lab technicians nowadays, they can superimpose and do a digital smile right over an existing scan. And then you can present that to the patient in a photo or a digital scan on a follow-up appointment after you take records. So the big question is, how many teeth? That is probably the number one question. I've had patients ask me, can you do these four front teeth? And I will sit down and look at them. And I know that that's all they may want, but I try to, if it works, I will meet their wants. Usually when I do a smile, complete smile makeover, I want to fill the corridor, the cosmetic corridor. And I'll show you that in a minute. It's usually eight teeth through the first by cusping. We call that the cosmetic corridor just because when most people smile, that's what it shows. If you've ever seen someone that had their front two, four, six front teeth and they smile, most of the time you will focus on those bicuspids because they're dark usually. And that's what happens. So to answer the question, the easiest thing to do is I hand the patient a mirror, just as I'm doing Tony here. And she said, well, how many teeth should I do? Now, as you can see, she has a wide smile. So I will tell her that due to your wide smile, you know, you can see through easily the second bicuspid excuse me, the first bicuspid there, and just the tip of the second. So again, that's the smile corridor. That second, because we're going to bring in our smile design with our lab, we're going to bring that first bicuspid out. Most bicuspids, if you start looking at your models, they will be in lingually. So we bring that out, and I'll show you that when we go through this. So I just hand them here and say, how many would you like done? Now, the most kind of, well, I'd like eye tooth to eye tooth. And then I will show them a picture of what happens when you do that. I said, we can do that and that's up to you. We can whiten that tooth and perhaps it won't be, but let me show you how it's indented here. So, you know, we talk about what is best for you and what it is that you want. Again, the most important thing, please listen, listen, listen. Listen to the patient. I can't say it enough. Listen to what they're saying. You and your assistant, be sure to take notes so that when you go to design this smile, you have heard and you can communicate this to your lab technician. I can't stress enough how important it is to communicate this, what the patient's desires and wants are to your lab technician as you work the case up. So, again, we talked about smile corridor aesthetics. So when this patient smiles, when the, you greet this patient and, they, and you're getting ready to design this smile, I want you to be able to visually in your mind, think about what you can do. 
what is it possible to change this patient's smile? What is possible for you in that smile corridor, that aesthetic zone? The key is to change what we see as possible. It truly is because you want to make sure that you articulate and you communicate this properly to the patient. For instance, this is Kelly. Kelly is one of the leading uh, real estate agents in Las Vegas. As a kid, she had composite veneers. And believe me, when she had this done, probably 20 something years before this, I think this has done a beautiful job lasting. She start, as you can see on number seven and eight, they're starting to get some micro leakage. And she just frankly said to me, she goes, you know, I've heard about what you can do. She goes, obviously I'm in public. I smile a lot. And she goes, I want to change my teeth. So I have to look at this and see what's possible. And you'll see Kelly's case in a little bit. Same with this patient. What is possible? I want you to be able to visually start thinking after tonight, what is possible with these patients? This is what I'm talking about. So if we go from here, can you visually see what is possible with this patient as you work the case up? And here is David. We're going to do David's case tonight. Uh, David's a friend of ours. You can see David, a uh, great guy, very close friend uh, from Michigan, born with tetracycline issues, and he just did not like his dark teeth. And Beth, she goes, Dr. Tomorrow, she goes, I am just, I'm tired of that space between my teeth. They put some uh, plaster, as she called it. Some, they glued some plaster on there to try to, try to close that space. And it just makes my my lips feel bulky and, and I'm just not happy with it. Is there anything you can do? You're going to see Bev's case tonight too. Okay, smile workup, smile evaluation. One of the first things I do is I want you to, this is called a Shimbashi. For those that don't know, Hank Shimbashi is a Canadian dentist. He took and did a study of how many different smiles, different teeth, biting together in CO. And what he found out is that if he measures from the CEJ to the CEJ, for instance, from the maxillary central CEJ to the mandibular lateral CEJ, he found out that the ideal smile is somewhere between 17 and 21 millimeters. Now, what the study showed is that if you get below 15, then a red flag should go up because there's usually occlusal issues or there's some type of issues where the patient would bite it, the case could potentially fail. And so one of the first things I do is I look at that space. And let me just show this to you. So with a patient with a uh, Shibashi of 12.56, beware because that bite is closed. I can't tell you how many times I've seen dentists struggle with a veneer flying off two or three times after they just put it on. And it's because one, they didn't check the occlusion. They didn't check the room they had. They didn't check the vertical height. And that's what the, one of the first things I do is I measure that space. Again, from the CEJ of the center to the CEJ of the lateral, that's called. So when you get below 15, red flags should go up because you know that that patient has most likely, they've had either clenching grinder, or they've closed their bite in most cases, okay? So in order to make a case successful, and we don't have the time, but in the all day course I go into this, there's certain occlusal principles that must be managed. I nicknamed this happy RV. And these are the occlusal principles that have to be managed. You have to look at this. This may be the first time for many dentists to realize what the mandible and the maxilla really go through when you close, when you chew. And I can't stress enough that in all my cases, I check a chewing cycle. And what we do is we put in a piece of rope wax and have them chew on one side. And we put articulate paper, lay it in there. And it's amazing how many interferences we find. But a mandible just doesn't go up and down. It has pitch, yaw, row. Vertical, we know that vertical is the most forgiving. You can open someone vertical, someone's vertical. And not have any issues. But when you change their AP, their anterior, posterior, that's the least forgiving. If you don't, if you think about it, some of the biggest issues from TMJ development has been when the orthodontist has closed that bite or 
presents a beautiful smile, but has locked that bite in, has not given the patient enough overjet. Whenever I get a case back from an orthodontist that has that locked in, I send it back and say, we need some overjet here so that this patient has freedom. So happy RV, horizontal and lateral. In other words, the curve of speed, anterior, posterior, curve of speed, curve of Wilson, anterior, posterior, the least forgiving. And the mandible does have pitch, yaw, and roll, and vertical. It's almost like an airplane landing. That's what I always tell my friends that are pilots. So this is a patient you definitely want to shy away from in doing veneers. If the patient insists on it, I will have them sign a release and they will wear a night guard. But here you can see all kinds of occlusal pathology. You have tori, which we know is definite signs of occlusal, occlusion malfunctions. When I say malfunctions, occlusal situations where they clench and grind. And you know, they have developed these tori probably from clenching. The amazing part is a lot of times in this patient, you don't see it so much. You do see it a little bit on the lower there. They wear their teeth down. This obviously is a deep overbite. Those, will, those veneers will fly off there. Or those three-quarter crowns will fly off there in no time flat. So you just, and these are two extremes. You just want to make sure that you be aware of what's going on with the occlusion. Excuse me. So the next thing we want to do is we want to use photography. We definitely want to take photos of the patient. We want to use it to present it, not only keep it as records, but also to our laboratory technicians. And the question that comes up is what views? So for years, we all used, Canon came out with a great dental package uh, for the dentist, the lens, the ring flash, and you know, they have been the expert in dentistry, as far as I'm concerned, in being able to obtain the photographs that we use for a smile makeover or every day in our practice. I use my camera every day on new patients. I take photos on every new patient. This is if you are interested in a 35 millimeter, this is Norman Camera out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. They're great. They understand dental kits. They understand dentistry. They have a kit already that you can purchase if you're looking for a camera. But now what I have, we just got the new eye special C4. I need to change this, is by Shofu. This is a point and shoot. I call it a camera for dummies, which, uh, you know, sometimes I want a certain view and all I have to do is pick this up. The beauty of this camera is that I have it, I keep it right by my side in the operatory. I don't have to take my gloves off. You can disinfect it. And it has eight preset modes, actually nine now with a video. And I use the standard mode. Obviously on the bottom is the isolate shade mode. And I also will use the low glare mode. And they are, this is again, point and shoot. It is so easy. And the pictures I'm gonna show you tonight, a lot of them were taken. So this is David. And I use uh, this camera to take David's picture. These are the views that I use, a full face. This is teeth together. Basically, it's the American Academy of Cosmetic Dental uh, photos set. If you follow that, teeth slightly apart. Now, why do I wanna show this one? Because we wanna see that wear on those teeth. I try to catch the mesio, the bicuspid, and see the over jet and the overbite, left side, right side. The occlusal view, this is always the hard one. If you have a hard time with this, set the patient up in your chair in the operatory, your dental chair, not in the patient dental chair, but the doctor chair, and just sit them up straight, retract cheeks. You'll find it much easier to take this view in the mandibular view. We want a hairline to chin with a smile, relaxed smile, not a heavy smile. Remax smile, base of nose to chin. Again, we want to see the incisal edges of the teeth, how they hit the lip. We want just a relaxed smile to see the opening and how the lips are formed against the teeth. These are all situations that you will learn to evaluate as you go through this. 
base of nose, left view. So let's get into our smile design now. So one of the first things I do is 3M provides imprint for. You know, I almost think I flunked out of dental school because I could never mix alginate, right? And when they came out with alginate substitute, then I thought, oh, if I could only just show my instructors in dental school, I don't have to mix that stuff anymore. I could never get the temperature right. You, you know, you're supposed to shake the container up and down. You open it, a genie drum jumps out and all this powder comes up. And then you're supposed to scoop it, tap it, you know, smooth it off, put it in, get the right temperature, mix it up, put it in the tray, take an impression. You had to pour it immediately. Then, excuse me, the sink would get filled with alginate that was left in the bowl, plug up the plumbing, whatever. This imprint for is a fantastic substitute for alginate. It can come in a large machine. I absolutely love this stuff. Take great impressions. Here's the beauty. You don't have to pour it right away. You send it to the lab, they can pour it, you can ship it. So it is a, a type VPS type, but it is the one thing that I love in my office is that when I can take impressions, diagnostic impressions and not have to mix alginate. So this is called imprint four. So what I do is I get a set of diagnostic models and I sit down with the patient. I also take a symmetry bite. What a symmetry bite is, you will have the patient stand up straight. They're against the wall, but they're not standing against the wall. You have them put their teeth together and CO. You take bite registration material and you take this crosshair, this symmetry bite, and you place it in and you want to go down the midline of their face. So what we're checking here is we're checking how the midline of the face lines up with the midline of the teeth so that when my lab technician mounts this, they can see if there's a discrepancy. And so that's how we check that is to see how the midlines. It's funny because in recent studies shows that only 12% of the population, they went around and asked people to smile, only about 12% noticed that the midlines were off. So a lot of times we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to check, to get midlines to line up with a facial midline, but only 12% had noticed in the studies that have been done. So I'll take a symmetry bite and now my lab technician, and there is a magnified photo of what it looks like. So now my lab technician knows where the facial symmetry, and I take a picture of this and send it to my lab with the wax diagnostic wax up and that's what it looks like so the patient bites down while they're still biting down retract their cheeks squirt the bite registration material on there this white part his little finger like projections you push it in and line that stick up with the midline of their face the beauty of this is is if the horizontal part is off, so is the vertical part. So if the vertical part is slightly tilted one way or the other, there's always a 90 degree angle formed between the horizontal and the vertical. So now my lab technician can check that. So the 10 rules of smile design, here we go. Size proportion of centrals, golden proportion, midline and arch alignment, inclination axial, lip line versus incisal edge, contact points, gradation, arch form, gingival symmetry, and gingival contour and zenith. These are the 10 rules of smile design that I use and I evaluate on every patient. And we're gonna go through these. So let's take a look. First thing I wanna do is one of the photos I'll take, David with a relaxed smile from hairline to chin is how does the one third of each section of the face look? In other words, for instance, I always tell my friends that are plastic surgeons, you can control the upper one third and the middle one third of a face with all your procedures that you do, but no one can control the lower one third because that has to do with the vertical and the occlusion of the teeth. We control that thing, put a beautiful chin in there, but we're the ones that control that. So we wanna take a look at the lips. Are they thick, medium thin, pupillary lines, 
How do those line up? Is one higher than the other? Are they slanted? Commissural line, normal, slanted down. And facial midline, normal, or is it off to the right or left of the patient? So that's the first thing that I take a look at. I take one of those big uh, photos that we take, and this one, hairline to chin, and I take a look with a relaxed smile where those line up. Now you're gonna see as we go through this why each step is so, so important. I take a skeletal pat pattern. Is it a class one, a class two, or class three? We already know that dentally, but what does the facial feature look like as a patient? I'll take that photo in addition. And then what I wanna know is what's the upper face compared to the lower face? Is it within normal limits? Is it excess or deficient? The reason I say this is because this is gonna design not only the, the length and width of the teeth that we want to, if we can do ideal, we will, but sometimes it affects the, how much the patient smiles. In other words, is it a wide smile, is it a narrow smile? So let's take a look at our smiles evaluation. This is the sheet. And so these are the rules that we're gonna go through. When I say rules, I'm gonna evaluate each patient. Number one, size and golden proportion. As many of you may know, golden proportion is a figure of math that uh, I, think, I believe Leonardo da Vinci came out with. But our ideal smile, that when someone has an ideal smile of just a beautiful, happy smile, that is actually a golden proportion. So how is that figured out? First of all, let's look at width of centrals compared to length of centrals. So here's our patient. Now, when, we, when I evaluate this, is it possible to, I, to achieve ideal smile? Well, by going through this smile design, we'll figure that out. And then we can discuss that with the patient when we can say we can get close to ideal or we can get ideal. Is it possible? So if we take an ideal smile, what we know is that we want to try to achieve the width to length ratio of about 77.5. I say if we're in the ballpark of 75 to 80, it's aesthetically acceptable. Ideal, 77.5. You can't get ideal many times because it may be bone to gingival issue. It may be, uh, you know, uh, openings where the smile doesn't show too much or the teeth are short that you're working with. We can always do perio surgery. We can do lasering. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But to achieve idea, don't try to kill yourself by getting idea. But if you're in the ballpark of 75 to 80, you're doing great. So let's take a look at golden proportion. Here is something that is very, very important. And the reason I say that is if, not, if you can't achieve the width to length ratio, at least try to get the golden proportion. And the way this is figured is we will use the lateral as a factor of one. Here's what I mean. If the width of your lateral is eight millimeters, I'm using this as an example, then the width of your central should be 1.62 times the value of the lateral. So 1.62 times eight. And then your cuspid from the spine of the cuspid, what I call the spine of the cuspid that comes down the middle to the mesial contact should be 0.62. If you can achieve this, and most of the time you can, you can get in that range of 75 to 80% with the length ratio. It will turn out just beautiful. So that's the first thing we evaluate. Midlines. I just told you that when they did a recent poll, that only 12% of the people they polled noticed that there was a midline discrepancy. But there, is, there are ways to correct that. We would like the midline 90 degree angle, and we would like the facial midline and the dental midline to line up. Here's an example of a patient. Here's an example of a patient whose midline obviously is off compared to the lower centrals. 
But what we were able to do is here's the preparations is we were able to do in our final preps, move that midline over to get very closely lined up. And these are the temporaries, as you can see, we got a lot closer. So how did we do this? There's where we started. What we did was we, first of all, worked it out on our models pre-op. Again, you're talking to your lab technician, you're studying this. And then we did a diagnostic wax up as to where we wanted to be. And then what we did was we just, without invading the biological width, without creating sensitivity, we just formed our margin. We moved that root towards that midline more. And thus, by doing that, excuse me, by doing that, we were able to get closer to that midline lining up. And again, you can see it here in the temps. So that's how you can do it. Please don't do this on your first smile makeover. But what you want to do is work it out with your lab, and you can contour that root to move it over. Again, for time's sake, we don't have enough time tonight to go into that. But if you call me or email me, I can help you with that if it ever comes up. Axial inclination. This is something most dentists don't realize. Are the teeth properly measly inclined? This is our patient here, and this is the patient after a different patient that shows the proper mesial inclination. As you can see, we want them to be slightly mesially inclined. Here is David with his finished results, and you can see here how they are mesially inclined. So I, when I did David's smile makeover, I did it as a live demonstration for 35 lab technicians. And each lab technician, I may say, I had to try in each case, they all, they are learning to, to fabricate Empress and Emacs. And so this, I prepared David in front of these people, a little stress, a little pressure, but then they took, and I had to try each one on, but this was prepared by the instructor for the course. And you can see with the proper inclination there, beautifully shown. Incisal, number five, incisal edges should follow the lip line. You know what happens, a reverse smile, maybe you've never thought of this, but a reverse smile gives an aged appearance as teeth wear down. Now you probably say, oh yeah, that's right. So you wanna make sure your incisal edges properly follow the lip line. This is Lynn. It's actually David's wife. And you see where her lip line, the incisal edges of their teeth follow her lip line very nicely. Improper placement of contacts. Ah, excuse me. So this is a case that actually uh, I was teaching a course and one of the uh, uh, doctors placed these in and he goes, he comes up to me and says, they look like bulk teeth. They look just like chiclets. They look huge. And I said, what's the problem? They go, it, it just too long. I said, hey, let's learn from this. So we had the whole group come over and we contoured this out. So you can see here, if you go from here and see the difference to there, how nicely. The next, that went too fast. I apologize. This buttons, okay. So you can nicely see how nice those contacts contoured in place. So don't panic if that happens. I guarantee you, if you do enough smile designs, you're gonna make adjustments. And I always tell patients, I said, I am going to customize these so that they fit you to your face, your smile. And we may do things, you know, a week or two after I place them in, you know? And some people, they want, little rounder teeth after they wear them for a week or two or even a month, no problem. But I don't panic. Don't panic when you first put them in and say, hey, we're gonna customize this for you. That's the word I use. We're going to customize this. Gradation of teeth. When a person smiles, as, they look, as you look posteriorly, their teeth should get smaller, shorter from cuspid on back. And this photo shows that. In other words, when you, prepare the smile makeover, that first bicuspid, we're gonna bring out buccally 
And those teeth, actually, they gradate to, so they look smaller as you look posteriorly. Number eight. So we want to know, is the arch form proper? This is something that a lot of dentists struggle with. And the reason I say that is this is where that view, the photo view of the upper palate. Is there a line that goes cusp tip of canine through papillae to cusp tip of other canine? If it doesn't, then as you and your lab technician plan the case, you can round this arch off. You can cheat on one tooth. And this is one of the number one reasons why I like to do eight teeth when I do my smile design, because I can cheat it on the bicuspid. So that if I have crowding on this, I can bring those teeth out. I can break those contacts. I can actually give an ideal smile with our golden proportion and our width to length ratio. But we have to study this. Please start noticing this on your models. Thus the importance, how important it is for models. Soft tissue condition. This is my favorite thing. It really is when I do smile designs. And that is lasering. Um, it makes a difference in night and day. It truly does. And in, in Kelly's case, I'm going to show you in a few minutes. You'll see why. Um, gingival height of laterals should be one to two millimeters shorter than central canines. When I say that, understand. When you go to laser, you have to probe to sound, sound to bone. And so what you want to do is you don't want to invade the biologic width. You don't want to invade that bone. But if you can give that ideal position of the gingival height, then you want to do that. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But when you can, it just turns out just beautifully. So that's the gingival height. Next, we're going to talk about gingival zenith. What the zenith is, is where is that actual height on each tooth located? So for instance, on the lateral, it's in the midline of, of the tooth. So that's where I start many times. I start with the lateral and it's in the central of the tooth. Now for the centrals and the cuspids, they're both slightly distal to the midline. So when I go to do my lasering, I actually start with the lateral put it in the middle, and then I go to the cuspid central, and I go slightly distal. And I can't stress enough how important the proper use of a laser is in smile design. So for instance, this is Kelly. Now, Kelly gave me permission to actually publish our case, and we did a few years back. And so here's Kelly's case to begin with. Now I want you to watch, just notice the ideal smile when it comes to width to length to golden proportion, but watch the gingival area. So you can see there that on the central, slightly distal, the lateral, I was able to achieve the ideal position of her gingiva. And really, I honestly feel that's what made her case. So now that we have gone through our 10 smile uh, design, we go through that with every patient. We go through each step. It's time to decide the shape of the teeth. And this is where I sit down with the patient again and said, we, in our previous consultation, we had, we talked about smile design. Now we want to talk about what kind of teeth, what shape of teeth. You know, not know what kind, but what shape of teeth would you like? So we sit down with that smile catalog and they still may not be able to tell you. We'll work it out with the temporaries. So now I'm going to take all my information. I'm going to send my bite registration. I'm going to send my symmetry bite, my models back to my lab technician. I'm going to communicate with my lab technician what the desire of the patient is. And we're going to do a diagnostic wax up. Let me tell you, my lab technician, not only is a very close friend of mine, but he is what makes me look good. His lab really makes me look good. And I never, ever like to hear a dentist say, well, the lab messed up. Don't throw your lab 
under the bus. If you have to throw your lab under the bus, perhaps it's time to change labs. My lab technician is Bob Clark with Williams Dental Lab. And he makes me look so good with my patients. And he understands occlusion. He understands different philosophies of occlusion. He also understands aesthetics and what makes a tooth look good. He also understands texture, why a ceramic tooth should look like a natural tooth. I just want to show you, this is a case, this patient came in, had two PFMs on, and two of these teeth are empress crowns. And this patient doesn't have much of an issue with clenching and grinding, therefore I felt safe using empress. Now, I love empress. My cuspid to cuspids on my smile makeovers are usually empress. The reason I love it is because I feel that I get the best aesthetics about that. But two of these teeth on here are empress crowns, and that's what I'm talking about. When I removed the PFMs, this is what I saw. And this is what Bobby gave me. So through photography, through working this up, we were able to make that patient very happy. No one ever knew that those were not real teeth. Here's another situation. The beauty, the texture, the transparency the, that you see in these teeth, they look like real natural teeth. Please do not just write call me on your lab slip. Write out written communication, what the patient's desires are and what you're trying to, to achieve. Remember that the dental technician is the builder, not the architecture and the builder. The doctor is the architecture of the case. You are in charge of designing that case, okay? So again, discuss with the dental technician our clinical findings, our smiles evaluation, the design, the shade. Again, they may, the patient may not know the design and shade, but most important, what the patient wants as a final result. I communicate that with Bob on every case I do. So for prep appointment, sometimes a patient say, I don't want to have another consultation. We'll just plan on the prep appointment and then you can show me the diagnostic wax up when we get back, uh, well, that you get back from the lab. And I'll say, okay, so we'll review, when the patient comes in before I prep, we'll review our findings and I'll show the patient with a diagnostic wax up what we're able to, to achieve. We'll talk about how I'm going to just do some uh, gingival architecture. I call it gum architecture. I'm going to do some lasering. And I'll show them the diagnostic wax up that I get back. Sometimes we'll get fancy and we'll add some pink, okay? But we will show them this diagnostic wax up next to their original diagnostic models. And we'll go back and forth showing them what we're going to change. Okay? But these are what, now I had Bobby wax this up in gray just for photo reasons. But from that diagnostic wax up, as you can see, we waxed from first bicuspid to first bicuspid. In back of that is the original models. And then they make a temporary stint. That's the orange impression material inside that Siltec stint. That is actually made from this diagnostic wax up that we're going to fabricate the temporaries that I'm going to show you. There's a question, a pre-question, do you adjust uh, the temporaries? Uh, with temporary cement on, and I, we don't cement these temporaries on. You'll see how they're actually shrunk wrap on. And then we also have a cavity prep. We want to make sure we give the lab technician what they need to achieve our goal. You know, I know that we all want to be conservative, and I'm very conservative in my preps, as, as conservative as I can be, but I also want to deliver the aesthetics that the patient is desired. If I have to take a quarter of a millimeter of tooth more away, I will do that in order to achieve that goal of the aesthetics that I want. So these are what comes back from the lab. I'll discuss it with the patient. Then we'll get off and we'll proceed with our treatment in order. So one of the first things we do is we make sure that before we prepare our smile makeover, we take care of all our emergencies. We want to make sure that the patient is periodontally sound. We did our comprehensive exam. We want to make sure that those gums, I never want to prepare teeth with bleeding gums, bloody gums. I do not want to 
prepare these teeth with patients with periodontal disease, active periodontal disease. We want to do everything that is not elective prior to doing a smile makeover. And I explain this to the patient. And a lot of times they want to really put the pressure on us as dentists. They want their smile, but we have to make sure we have a solid foundation. So we want to make sure that we take care of that. Such things such as smile makeover, orthodontics, full mouth reconstruction, they are what I refer to as elective. And when I say that, what I mean is that we want to make sure we have no presence of decay on any teeth we're not going to be preparing for our smile makeover. One of the things that is mandatory with my smile makeover in full mouth reconstruction patients is a, prob a, a uh, situation where I want to make sure the gums are not bleeding. So what if I could show you an entirely new approach to augment your long-term success in pre and post restorative cases? Would you be interested? What if I could show you an entirely new approach to augment your long-term success and periodontal maintenance of your implant patients? And in fact, the majority of your patients who have had long-term periodontal issues, would you be interested? So we're gonna make sure this patient is periodontally sound, no bleeding gums. I want those gums to dance. I want them pink. I want those embrasures to be firm, knife edge. If this new protocol enhanced your hygiene success rate and supported the concept of superior biofilm maintenance and long-term health, would you be interested? In regards to geriatric patients, if this system can further add to decreased caries and overall gingival periodontal health, would you be interested? Or those patients who have periodontal surgeries in the past and have regressed, what alternatives are you offering them? You know, those patients that come in every three to four months who still have multiple sites with bleeding upon probing, we term these refractory patients. We all see this. We all have these patients. They come in every four months, every three months, and they still have bleeding upon probing. So what is this magic pill that I'm talking about? Again, before I put any patient through a smile makeover, I make sure that I do this. And this is Perio Protect. Many of you may not have heard, or many of you may have heard of Perio Protect, but let me share with you what Perio Protect is. It's a tray, an FDA cleared, a prescription medical device that places solutions of the dentist's choice into the gingival sulcus or periodontal pocket. Let me just say that it works by physics. In other words, there's a hydraulic pressure that forces this material to flush the curricular fluid of the periodontal issue, of the periodontal gum issue, if it's diseased. Even if it's healthy, I have patients that maintain their health on Perio Protect. They differ from other trays or mouth guards in that the flexible material is custom formed with specialized seal. It's that seal. Again, it's that seal that causes this to become health, to deliver the material, the medicine to that crevicular area. And therefore it flushes out that crevicular area, getting rid of that biofilm situation. This is what the tray looks like. This is what the gasket seal is. I can't stress enough how important this gasket. A lot of dentists try to make their own Perio Protect trays and they never get this seal. It won't work. It just won't work. This is another view of what it looks like. So the key is overcoming the curricular fluid flow with a gasket type seal along with oxygen releasing gel. This is a diagram showing exactly. And before I started studying this years and years ago, I didn't realize that uh, curricular flow cleans out the pocket area 40 times per hour under healthy conditions. And even more so when the pocket becomes infected. If you do the research on that, you'll find that that's the case. So you have this curricular fluid that, again, is being cleaned out 40 times per hour on the average. And this is what it's all about. This is what we fight every day in our dental offices is the biofilm. Another way of looking at recurring problems, what's going on between appointments, as I said, what happens every three months and they come back? So what we do is we put these patients on Perio Protect, it's a well-designed tray that once filled with a low dose of hydrogen peroxide to maintain our patient's periodontal health. And I can't tell you enough how this has changed. To me, 
This has been one of the greatest inventions, one of the greatest uh, avenues of getting rid of periodontal disease. It's taken patients to health and it's so easy to do. Our patients absolutely love this. These peroxides shift the biofilm communities into growth, defensive growth modes, limiting their ability to reproduce or trigger inflammation. Thus, we are doing our best to control the biofilm. So the gasket seal allows the dose of hydrogen peroxide to treat the pocket 10 to 15 minutes. We have the patient when they're taking a shower, fill the tray, and we'll, I'll show you that in a minute, introduce it, place it in their mouth, and they just gnash on it for 10 to 15 minutes while they're showering, rinse the trays out. So easy. And so the conclusion of the study is the application of peroxide gel as an adjunct to frequent periodontal maintenance appointments for refractory patients, for implant patients, for smile makeover patients, for smokers and non-smokers has changed the difference of periodontal disease in our office. So the patient will originally get the tray. They will apply the, the gel into the tray, 1.7%. And I'm going to show you how it, the gel comes in just like a tube of toothpaste. For the first three or four months, they will wear it two times a day, usually. Three weeks after we take the impression, they get the trays. Once we have them come back after 90 days, we see how it's going. After six months, if it's all cleared up and we can do that, it's routinely done. Then we put them on maintenance for one time a day for 15 minutes. Some patients will put on maintenance twice a day, morning and night before they go to bed. So with all the data that shows how this effectively controls the biofilm, and we literally, I'm gonna show you some cases where we take patients that have multiple bleeding upon probing sites, they get down to one or two in no time. This was introduced to me originally by my hygienist who had her husband uh, before she started working with me on the Perio Protect. And it was amazing when she showed me where he went and that's how I got interested in it. But it should be in all our offices, not just for smile makeovers, but obviously for those refractory patients, for implant patients, all our implant patients we place on this. Thus, we try to do our best to eliminate uh, implant with periodontal disease. The primary ingredient is the 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel as the oxygenating agent. This is how it comes. You can have it in your office. They can also order it online, but usually we have it right in our office. So this is how it comes. And then in our practice, in over the past 11 years, we've used it in these cases, patients after laser therapy, even after surgery, still having bleeding upon, as I mentioned earlier, We'll use it with those patients. Patients prior to active therapy, patients prior to actually going into periodontal therapy, patients with ongoing peri-implantitis, as I talked about around implants, patients with medical histories that reduce their oral inflammation. Perhaps it's some type of autoimmune situation. Patients who want to bleach and have been sensitive, high carry risk patients, zero stomach patients, those are huge cancer patients. We use this routinely. So let me just share with you over the past six plus years, our practice has delivered approximately 20% of our patients perioprotective cases. We charge $375 per tray, okay? So we actually, for digital, we up it to $400 and the patients don't mind. They get two tubes are included. So we have an in-office plan and we, uh, that is covered by our in-office dental plan. Assume a $250 profit, and again, this is the business side, or 85K in profit in three years. So here is another opportunity. Not only are you helping the health of the patient tremendously, I can't stress enough how important this is, but you also, from the business side, you are increasing your profitability in the office. Good news, that was eight years ago. As of two years ago, present fee is $450 per arch. 
The conversion occurs routinely in hygiene operatory. And this is why the team must be in the same page. You have to have your hygienist on the same page as you are. Instructions, 10 minutes a day and maintenance two to three times a day before or during treatment. So once they achieve maintenance, it's one times a day. If they're not in maintenance, sometimes it's two to three times, usually two times a day for about 15 minutes. They just put it in, it rinses right out. Most patients wear them daily when they shower, as I mentioned, just to repeat, then brush it, their teeth. They love the freshness. They absolutely love the freshness. Now, my wife is a hygienist. We've never worked together. And she has about four pockets she just cannot get under control. She wears her Perio Protect trays every day. And that pocket has not changed since she started that. She has a four millimeter pocket and it bugs the living daylights out of her. But she wears that. So again, the, the hygiene operatory is where the conversion, the assistants scan or take the impression. And the whole office must be on board with this because the front team has to answer the financial questions. So when you introduce this to your office, Perio Protect will actually help you train the whole office. So the hygienist monitors results upon recall. Now, when I introduce the tray on a smile makeover, I have them come back about two or three weeks after I introduce it to see how they're doing because they've already been through any type of hygiene therapy before we even consider smile makeover. But I also put them on this and I wanna see the freshness. Sometimes all I need is a month on Perio Protect. And then when I do the smile makeover, I'm gonna share with you, I give them those Perio Protects. So again, the assistants are gonna take the impressions or do the scans. So this is what it, the case, it comes and how it comes. And the setup looks just like this. This is the day of delivery. You get the nice little case and there's, and then we actually have the patient, we demonstrate and have the patient put the gel in and they should passively fit. And here you can see the 1.7% gel in there. Now, why do I have my patients after a smile makeover wear Perio Protects? This is Dustin. This is Dustin's, he had fluorosis. Someone told me he had touch line, but he had fluorosis. So he was getting married. And actually the day he got married, after a smile makeover, his mother, and from, they were out from out of town. Dustin lived in Las Vegas. They all were in our reception room. There's like 25 people just thanking us for doing Dustin's smile makeover. And so what we had him do is that he said, you know, Dr. Tomorrow, I can only, my uh, wife to be and I, we can only afford to do the upper teeth. So we actually had him white in the lower teeth. And this is what happened when Dustin came back. He wanted very white upper teeth, but this is what he looked like. He's a smoker. So then this is what he looked like. He skipped his six month cleaning. I put him on Perio Protect. This was 90 days later. So you can see the difference. Here, here, to here, here. It cleared the entire gingival inflammation right up. The good news is these are the insurance codes. So it is covered by insurance. Uh, it's part of the Perio plan under insurance. I don't do insurance, but the people at Perio Protect will help you. So here's a nice little offer for all participating tonight. Your first Perio Protect case free with training. Please take a screenshot of this. I'll have it at the end when we go through finishing up. And all you have to do is call that number, mention Dr. Tomorrow that you were on tonight's webinar, and you get your first Perio Protect case free. They will train you and your team. It's not long training. It is so easy. Please, please, please incorporate this more. So we're back to the preparation. Here's what we, where we started. Give the lab what they need to give you the results you have planned for your preps. First step. Gingival symmetry, gingival height, contour, and gingival. This is a diode laser. We have one, each hygienist has one, so I'll have to go steal it. But this is a ultradent laser, a Gemini. It has dual wavelength. I would recommend if you're looking for a laser, this is, I think, one of the best lasers on the market. It's called a Gemini. So this shows you exactly, this is Maria, and I'm just gonna show you what we can do with a 
Ginger back to me with the laser. So she says, you know, I like my smile, but it's too gummy. I want to wipe my teeth. Is there something you can do? This is the day I did it. Again, if you see our gingival height and Xena. And this was eight days later. She went on to whiten her teeth and she was very happy. So that's what a laser can do. So when I do my laser and it's the same day I do my prep, if you do it with electric surge, you will have shrinkage. We don't even have an electric surge anymore. We all used to have to use them because we didn't have the lasers like we have today. So Bobby will tell me, my lab technician will tell me where we want to laser. And I will, we, he and I will communicate that with each other. So here we're showing you how I'm lasering. I'll get, remember the height of the gum on the lateral should be one to two millimeters lower than that of the cuspid and central. So you can see I took a piece of floss here, lined it up, and there's our lasering. And you may not have to laser the whole area, you just may have to establish that Xena. Here is David. You can see that uh, when I'm demonstrating here, um, I'm going to do the central and the lateral. So remember our friend Beverly, the Southern Belle, and she wanted that space. Now I knew that that diastema, because I'd done a residency in sedation, and the oral surgeons, my backgrounds in histology, I used to have to, I would show them so that that muscle wouldn't reattach that you had to scar the bone literally. And so that it wouldn't come back. But with lasers, that's not necessary. So I knew that that muscle is what kept those teeth apart at some point in her life when they developed. So I got pretty dramatic. Now this is drama. And I have to be honest with you. Was I concerned when I did this? I was very concerned. but. As it turns out, we have beautiful healing. I had done just the upper, and when I got the upper done, she goes, Dr. Tomorrow, she goes, my upper teeth look so nice. Can you do my lower teeth? And I go, twist my arm. Of course we can. So when we prepare, we want to make sure that we do our depth cuts. We want to be very conservative, and we want to leave as much tooth structure as we can. But on the other hand, we also want to give our lab technicians what they need. So I'll do my depth cuts, then I'll take my big mother burr, and I will prep the teeth to the contour. Now, I am, in most cases, I prefer to break contacts. Now, I know there's a lot of dentists out there that don't, but there is nothing that drives me more wa wildly crazy when I have a patient come back after two years and you see stains where that margin entered interproximately, even if I bury it towards the lingual more, it still picks up, and it's also a very active area of recurrent decay, of decay. So here I'm breaking the contacts and I do go over the incisal edge and I do more like a three quarter veneer prep. So let's look at some special considerations here. This is crystal tetracycline. So I do not want to, my lab technician to depend on an ingot to block this out. So what I will do is I will take either pink or opaque composite. Here's some pink composite Filtex from 3M. I used to use Scotch Bond. Now, recently, they came out with Plus. Everybody has to upgrade. And here you can see it's just like the previous Scotch Bond. It's self etch, total etch, and you can use it on multi service. So it is a primer, it does have MDP in it. So I will, if it's in Denton, I will apply that, dry it, cure it and apply my opaque to block that out. That way I can dictate the dent and shade. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. I'm dictating the dent and shade so that the ingot doesn't. I'm just getting some notes here. Sorry. So this is the result. So opaque composite. What it happens, and we all run into these posts, all right? So here's a post, how do we block that out? Remember, I love to use Empress in the anterior, real simple. You, first of all, micro etch it, and you're gonna use a metal zirconium primer. Now, the new Universal Scotch Bond has that in it, but I still personally apply the metal primer to it, okay? And I'll dry that. Cure it, and I'll first of all flow opaque over it, flowable opaque. Then I'll add my composite and block that out. You can see there.
And here you go. That was the result. Beautiful, that post. So preparation guides are given to us from the lab, as I mentioned. And that's, we want to make sure we give the lab what they need in order to provide for us the aesthetics that the patient has desired. I also take a rubber cup. This is made by Kerr Rotary. It's a P0355. And I round those preps off. If you look there, if you want to see porcelain crack or fracture, just have sharp at line angles. And I'll use that just go over the top and round them off. This is David, as I talk. Here's different pictures of conservative different preps. I don't know why this thing's advancing. Here, and different other photos, clearly defined preps. So we can go conservative and also, depending on the age, the, the very conservative prep is a young person that had some genetic issues, uh, developmental issues uh, with their teeth, and we placed porcelain instead of composite. So I was very, very conservative in that. So we want clearly defined preps. So we wanna do our shade selection before we go on. We wanna make sure the teeth are kept moist. Please do not call the stump shade stump. We call that a dent shade, please do not. We wanna make sure we cervically blend it and blend all the shades together. We wanna to have value, we wanna address value translucency, surface texture, shade mapping. So what I do is I'll hold up a dent and shade and I always go with the darkest. Now, if you look at David's teeth, his incisal edges are light. So I'll take a picture of that and show that to my lab technician. So I always will choose the darkest color. Here, you can see it's a little lighter in this situation. See, technicians can see through that when they make these models and they have their hand working rubber model, they can see through that. And this is a, a graph that a graphic that shows what they can see if you don't give them. Dentists have asked me, why, why is it so important to give them the proper dent and shade? Because when they come up with the final results and this is beautiful aesthetics, you can actually see that dent underneath if it's not, that dent and shade is not blocked out and working up to the proper shade by the lab technician. So you wanna make sure you have gingival blending to block that shade out and give the, dent, the dental technician that proper cervical shade so that they can blend to the incisal edge. Hopefully everyone understands that as you can see here, as we're demonstrating on these drawings. So then what I will do is I will take and I will show the patient different shade selection. Now at this time, I'm not gonna show them the shade selection with their teeth prepared. I'm gonna wait, but I will use those shade guides and we're going to adjust, address color mapping. Why is color mapping important? As I mentioned before, we wanna blend the cervical margin, cervical to the margin. The, remember the enamel is the thinnest, obviously at the gingival margin. Natural gingival blend here, and incisal translucency. I love incisal translucency. I love texture. I usually go medium to heavy on the translucency and I go medium on the texture of the porcelain. So we wanna make sure that we get to our final shade. Do we want any characteristics? We have to address that. I can put certain characteristics in afterwards. So if we have a dent and shade of ND8 and our final shade is gonna be an 020, the lab technician knows they have to work up from an 040 at the gingival to blend it to an 030 to get there. This is the type of texture. These are actually crowns that I'm getting ready to put in a patient's mouth. You can see the beautiful texture. Those look like real teeth here. Surface anatomy, smooth, light, medium, heavy. What type of anatomy do you want to have there? Incisal translucency, light, medium, heavy. Flat, incisal characteristics. Do we want anything on the incisal edges? As you can see here. 
So these are the characteristics we want to address. As you can see here, here's a patient that wanted just a little bit of a mammalon effect. And when she smiles, and this is a close up. Can you see them from a distance? Not at all, but it gives it beautiful, some beautiful characteristics. Some patients want some. If I will ask them, do you want to have little mammalons there? I can put them in a little bit, but I always make it so I can take them out later too. It doesn't shorten the crown much, but this is a close up. So this is a little more dra dramatic than you actually see with the naked eye. So the lab prescription should include multiple things. Now you can get real fancy and I've done this where I use different colors for different shades to show Bobby exactly. First of all, I want you to notice the length of the centrals, where we're going from our wax up, what we changed. You know, we, the reason why I want that is if I just lasered in our diagnostic wax up, that diagnostic wax up may not show the same length of the central. So I'm now going to measure that length of that central once I have the temporary in there where I lasered. And you're going to show them the different characteristics. You're going to show them the different shades. You're going to make sure that you have the proper dent and shade. So this, again, back to the original photo where we talked about, if the patient liked the color at that time, I will shoot my lab technician that picture there and show them. And these, I use the chromoscope a lot because they have very nice bleach shades and different shade selections and the cervical body shade we have here of the dentin. Disappearing super gingival margin. We wanna make sure we have that body stump. We know it's dentin now, length of dent of centrals in our shade. So make sure that we give our lab technician everything they need for this in the patient's age. So we fill all this out, we take our time. A lot of times this is a shortcut. A lot of dentists make this a shortcut. Please don't do that, take that. So in conclusion, we wanna make sure we have the vertical dimension, length of central, smile design, color characterization. Now the vertical dimension you'll see I'll measure after the shimbashi, I get the temporaries on, as well as the length of centrals. Bobby already knows the smile design. He does not know the color. In fact, I may not, I may send the case to him and not decide on the color for two or three days when I see the patient back to check their bite and to check the temporaries. And I also, at that point, will talk to characterization and I will communicate at that time with my lab technician what we want. So when it comes to impressions, we either have, we have garbage in and garbage out. If you do not give your lab technician the exact dimensions, in other words, your impression should be exactly, exactly what you see when you prep the teeth. There should be no voids. You should, because what you're going to get back is what you give the lab technicians. Now, lab technicians are so nice that they don't want to tell you what you sent them may be garbage. I'll be straightforward. Again, garbage in, garbage out. They try to work with your impression. But if you have a good relationship with your lab technician, if I send something to Bobby and he goes, hey, is there something different about this? It's not normal. I'll take a look at it. Maybe it was an impression for a study model and I didn't check my assistant that took the study model and there's a void. He'll call me on it. That's the type of relationship I want my lab technician. Nothing personal. So these are different impression materials, for instance, that 3M has. I love using their Impra gum and their Imprint 2. And I'll show you a couple of photos here of what I'm talking about. Impregum is a polyether and it's very nice. It's not like the old polyether. This has give, cause the old polyethers, it got into undercuts, that sucker would get locked on. So here's a couple of lower centrals and, and lateral. And you can see well-defined margins. This is very, very nice. They're polyether, Impregum. Here's a full mouth case where I use it. The beauty of it, is it is somewhat forgiven around moisture. This is the imprint too. This is my go-to when I do smile makeovers. It's a polyvinyl. And you can see here that the margins are well-defined. It's free of voids. You can see each margin. That's under mag 
education about photography. So this is what I like to play to show during presentations what it looks like and you can actually see the margins very nicely. So this is 3M imprint. Let me just say there's a lot of very good uh, impression materials out there. There's another one by Kettenbach called Panacell. Boco has, there's a lot of good polyvinyl impression materials out there. That was one of the questions that came up. So temporization. Don't ever freak if you see this under a temporary. This is micro leakage. Uh, the reason I show this is because I've had like a half a dozen of these in my career. And what happens is that it's just a micro leakage where the bacteria can get under the, the patient will call you and say, I think my tooth's dying. It's turning black. Tell them to relax. All you do is take some hydrogen peroxide on an infusion tip or on a uh, cotton swab and you just clean it right up. It comes right off. So not to panic. So the first thing to avoid this is you apply consepsis to the tooth. You bathe that tooth in consepsis. Here's it is with an infusion tip. Consepsis is made by UltraDent and we just pour it on there and then we air dry it. And then we're going to apply our temporaries. So this is ProTemp by 3M. So this is where it gets fun because this is where the patient may start crying after the fabrication of temporaries because this is where the real change takes place. So remember when we did the wax up and I said they will make a silk tech temporary stent. They, from the wax up, they take and place polyvinyl impression in this silk tech stent and they actually pick up the details of that wax up. So you're gonna fill it, keep that tip down and you're gonna fill it so there's no air bubbles in it to your best ability. You're gonna introduce it into the mouth. Now I mark the midline and the cuspids with a Sharpie. So I, when I'm going into the mouth, I have direction. And what I do is I seat it, the soft tissue will stop it. And then I massage the buccal and lingual a couple of times back and forth to get rid of the excess. And when you take it off, and this is literally, this is straight the way it is. You can see I have a little void on number seven incisal. We'll take a little flowable, but this is how it comes out, just like that. It's beautiful. No cement. It's shrink wrapped on there. And then I'll check the bite. I'll remove any excess, check the bite. Make sure the patient is sitting up. Anytime you do any type, even delivering a single unit, I always do a final check of the occlusion setting up. And this is what it looks like, just like that. So we'll adjust the bite. You can see I did a little lasering there that it healed just fine. And I'll have the patient back in two days, to check the bite and make sure we've removed all the excess uh, temporary material. Now I do get a little fancy at times. This is Kerr Color Plus, where I'll take some blue for the halo and some white for the halo. And I'll add a little yellow for the gingival or okra. And that's what it looks like. So these are temporaries. In fact, we've had patients say, can I just leave these temporaries on? I go, no. So then I'm gonna measure the length of those centrals. That measurement's not right. I didn't correct it, but that's the picture I have. So I'll measure the length of the, with my calipers and I'll write that down. Because remember, I laser. And then I'll take the shade and show the patient. And if the patient can't decide, I will walk them outside or I'll make sure that the operatory has proper lighting. So, our final shade selection, again, don't panic if the patient can't decide. The lab technician can wait, have them back in a couple of days. So we want to make sure that we, again, to review this, our color mapping, that we have everything down, everything from the value. Do we have any special features we want in the crowns? Do we want any type of different texture? Do we want any type of mammalons? Do we want, you know, these are things, the mammalons I can add, always add, but is there anything, any craze lines? You have to make sure we communicate this with the lab technician. Then I'll take an impression of the temporary and send it with the case with my impressions. So in conclusion, we've got the vertical dimension, the length of centrals, the smile design, color characterization, characterization color mapping. Just do not write on your lab slip, call me, fill it out properly. So now the case goes off to the lab, the shade is decided, and we're going to get ready to see, okay? 
First thing I do is I put it on the model. Now, Bobby gives me a fixed model. I will tell you that if I do 10 cases, I may have to only adjust two or three contacts. That's the truth. They do their contacts under a microscope. They know how I like my contours. And I put it on a model to make sure I will check the contacts with floss on the model first. This is a fixed model. The second thing that I tell dentists, I don't have to worry because my lab does, please, please check that your lab automatically applies hydrofluoric acid to your porcelain. There's some labs, unless you ask, they do not. And what that means is that that hydrofluoric acid that they do at the lab, that allows you the surface texture to bond this to the tooth. So if you, most labs do, you don't have to worry, but just double check, please double check, make sure. We're gonna use Reliax veneer. It's my go-to for my smile makeovers in my anterior cases. The reason I love this, one, it's easy to work with. Two, I just use the base. I can actually pre-fill them, cover them with a towel and they can sit there for a long time. They're strong, they're very strong. They're light here only. They don't have, it's not a dual care. Again, I'm just using the base, no catalyst involved. They're high adhesion to, to dentin and enamel, low film thickness, high abrasion resistance, good mechanical strength, and they have radio, it has radio opacity. For years, I used a cement that didn't have radio opacity. And when a patient moved one time, I had him call me from North Carolina and say, hey, uh, are these really cemented on? I don't see any cement. It was not a radio opaque cement. So nowadays, almost everything is a radio opaque. And the, also the beauty is the try-in paste matches up very clearly to the same cement. So as you can see here, the different shades of cement. Now I will tell you, I am one person that usually 99.9% of the time use, use translucent cement. And the reason for that is I want my lab technician and myself to control the shape. If I need to increase the value slightly, I'll move up to a relatively new, it's about three years old, the B0.5. That will increase the value just slightly. But the beauty of this is you can try them in with the try-in paste, and it's going to be exactly the same color as your cured cement. There's a lot of cements that the try-in paste and the cured cement are actually different. So here's a case before where we started. I'm going to take you through this, and this was after. So let's quickly go through this. We're getting short on time, and I apologize. I'm trying to present the meat and potatoes of a smile design in two hours. So again, you'll have my phone number and email, please call me. So this is what we started with. We did the diagnostic wax up, did our, we did our conserv very somewhat conservative preps. I break the context, but we wanted to give them idea. If we go back here, you can see that we have black triangles. And we have number seven is a smaller lateral than that of 10. So I had to adjust my preparations to make sure that we could give them and there's the temporaries on the right. So then the patient comes back, we remove the temporaries and we try each veneer on separately, then together. And then you can try the try and paste. A lot of times I'll just use water, but the try and paste is good for you to do it to make sure the patient likes the color. And I'm gonna show you here how easy, again, for that to confirm the shade, for the patient to confirm the shade, but, Let's do a little test here. Let's do a little try and paste with high value on the left, low value on the right. Clean it up. Our goal was to have an 040 shade. As you can see here in the photo, the low value on the right, the high value on the left as you look at the picture. There you go. So you can see that difference in what cement, how cement can influence that shade. So here, when I was doing David's case, again, it was in, with 35 lab technicians, we decided, the gentleman that was in charge of the course, decided to see if we could tell the difference. I would play some if the lab technicians could tell the difference between Empress and Emacs. And you can see where we've come with our development of Empress and Emacs. Emacs has gotten even closer to the uh, aesthetics of Empress. Nothing wrong with Emacs today. Good, good, good lab technician can get them right on. So here's our Empress, and there's our Emacs. 
So we're going to try them in and then we're going to take them off. So the first thing I do is if you use try and cement is rinse it out, rinse and dry it. And it cleans right out. And I set them on a tray by numbers. Okay. Usually it's obviously five through 12. And I'm going to treat them with 35% phosphoric acid for one minute. And then I'm going to rinse. Here's our ultra etch. 35%. And that's just to clean any blood or any saliva off that. Rinse and dry. Okay. And then I'm going to apply silane and primer and allow to dry for one minute. Now, my assistant will do this Why I'm getting the rubber dam ready on the patient if I'm going to use a rubber dam. Do I use a rubber dam every time? No, quite honestly. But also remember with the new universal scotch bond, it has the primer and silane in it. I will use that sometime and it, you allow it to set for a minute and dry it or I will use the Kerr Silane Primer all in one bottle. But it's important that you rinse and dry it after phosphoric acid and apply Kerr Silane and Primer. I will apply it, set that to the side to dry, and then I will isolate. A lot of people ask how you do this. You just cut an arch in your rubber dam, and then you can put a, a dry angle on the roof of the mouth, and you can take bite registration material to isolate, and that rubber dam will stay back. It's actually, the fastest, the easiest way, you don't have to worry about saliva, you don't have to worry about anything. So when I go to etch, I will etch three teeth at a time. Now, when I seat my cases, I seat the two centrals, the two laterals, and then the two cuspids. And I will remove the excess cement with a rubber tip, and I'll show you that in a minute, but I will etch three at a time. Remember, if this is dentin, you only want that on there for 10 seconds. And then I will rinse and dry, keeping that moist, keeping those teeth moist. How moist? I always tell doctors about the moist that you have on your lips, the moisture of your lips when you put your tongue across. Just keep it moist. And there's the other side. This is a different case. I'm just showing this as a demo. So we'll rinse and dry that, keeping the teeth moist. And then what I'll do is I will apply the Scotch Bond Universal now. And why my assistant has dried the silane primer, she's applying the cement to the restorations. Again, you can apply that, it can set, I've had them set there 15, 20 minutes, they won't set because it's only the bond. Now, if you get it up close to light, it may set, but we cover it with a paper towel. So here you see, after we apply it, and when I say the number one area of sensitivity, I believe is not scrubbing this. I scrub this on each tooth for a good 20 seconds, and then I air thin it. You see me curing here, I no longer cure it. I prefer not to cure. Please don't cure it. There's no studies that show that you have to cure it to increase bond strength or anything. The reason I don't is sometimes you'll have a puddle and when you cure that, the restoration won't fit the same. So I do not cure at this stage. I make sure I air thin it. If you obviously wanna get rid of the, either the acetone or alcohol, depending on what bonding agent you're using. And that's why you throw the stream of air on there. And then here you see my assistant, she's loading, and then we'll apply them all. And what I do is I see all of them at once. And here you can sometimes I'll tack, if, if the gingiva starts bleeding a little bit, I'll tack, and that's what I'm showing here, just for a little bit. But usually what I do is I'll take an orange tip and you can see it here before I tack, and I'll clean the excess off. And this, so we, let me go back here. So here we've cleaned the excess with the tip and then I cure it. I will hold all six of those restorations. I'll push up all the way, push up all the way and hold that and have the patient push down and more cement will ooze out and my assistant will wave and tack it. Now we have the bicuspids. So sometimes when you do this, the bicuspids, they'll get a little tight. I'll make sure the contacts are right. And then the question is, do I want to total etch the bicuspids? If I have low retention or uh, you know, not much retention on the tooth, I will do a total etch and I'll use the uh, Reliax veneer. Or most of the time I'll use a self-etch Unisim 
dual cure cement by 3M. And that's what this looks like. It's a self-adhesive resin cement. And I absolutely love it. Use it in my posteriors a lot. So before I do this, I'll make sure again, I rinse it, treat it with phosphoric acid, just to review that 30 seconds, rinse dry and apply monobond, let it set for one minute. And then I'll apply the cement and I'll seed it and I'll tack it. And then I'll go around and wave everything and I'll just make sure that the initial tacking and everything is set. And I'll go about cleaning it up. Here you can see I'm doing this with David. And it, this cement comes off very nicely. And I'll have them back two days later, not only just to check the occlusion, but also the cement. And, I, and I'll find myself saying, how come I didn't see this the day that I put it in? You just don't because it's blending with the tooth, whether it be on the lingual or the interproximal, but sometimes you'll have some residual cement. And I'll use a fit strip by Garrison to go in between. The first thing that you do wanna do is you wanna make sure that you clean that cement out with, I use Glide as soon as possible. Otherwise, as that cement, as you cure it, tack it, that cement can create a diastema. So you have to be hurried to clean that out. Let me just warn you of that. Here's your fit strip. I'll take a fine diamond sometimes if needed very carefully to remove any excess. It's just a finishing diamond, very, very, very fine diamond. And then I'll check the occlusion sitting up. I'll use Garrison's, I'm a person of systems. So Garrison came out with an Emax zirconium, whatever your polishing system is. And I can use that on my Empress too. It's just a nice kit. It polishes it. And this is what the final on David looked like. There's a smile. And there's what we started with. And there's what we ended with. Now, these are the completed veneer restorations. And you can see with the Real IX cement how nice that is, the befores and the afters. So I'm just running a little bit behind, but let's quickly go through the art of dentistry. Again, before and after every smile makeover patient, I will give them the trays afterwards. You know, the lab cost on that is, is just so small for what you're doing and what you're charging. I will make them a new tray if I'm just doing the upper or the lower. I will more than give it to them. I do charge them for the initial trays. Again, here's the insurance codes. And again, your first case is free. So that's how I finish that is I do after they have that and we've adjusted by we, about a month, four to six weeks after I do it, I'll take a new impression and make them a new set of trays. So I just want to show you some cases. This is a Glenn, 85 year old patient. His family just wanted him to have some nice anterior teeth. The kids all got together and said, can you give him just a nice smile? And so everything doesn't have to be white. You know, here's a, a he, he's 85 and he said, I just want some nice teeth for the rest of my life. But here's Kelly again to show her case. And her smile turned out very nice. And our Southern Belle Beth that we did the major lasering in. And here's her case. Crystal, the tetracycline to block out. And Lynn, who started with composite, she accused me of breaking that composite and size ledge there on the distal on number eight, didn't touch it. And there's her case. There's Lynn, smile, beautiful smile. Beth was my trainer, believe it or not. And I knew that if I didn't do this right, she was gonna kick my butt. But there's what she started with. She had composites and the cervicals. She had just a beautiful lady she wanted. That's what we started with. That's what we ended up with. She wanted some mammalons on there. And this is Joe. This is a, uh, a situation where I told you uh, he was going to see a dentist and the dentist, he was in so much pain. This was a full mouth case with 18 months. It took me to do this because of TMJ issues. We worked him up and we got him comfortable. This is what happens when you don't do a comprehensive exam is you don't listen to the patient they're describing their pain and discomfort. So he had some major occlusal issues. Dustin, we whitened the lowers, the anteriors. 
This is my niece, Kristen. She was born with uh, uh, Melogenesis Imperfecta. Back in the days when she was uh, like 17, what we had was PFMs. I thought it was beautiful then, and we redid it. She asked me, and she just beautiful smiles. So this is a type of work that we all love to do. Um, and hopefully you've got some pearls tonight. I realize that in two hours that it's hard to get everything in. Here's a patient. She came from Denver. This was just a couple of years ago. And I said, did anyone ever tell you uh, that you, there's something going on possibly? She goes, no, I just thought it was the margin of the crown. She had deep decay under those. I had to block them out. And she was getting ready for an implant, but she wanted her teeth taken care of. When we removed those, it was, this is a patient with, you just would not just do, and the reason I show this is not just a case, but you have to be careful here. You notice the incisors there, they have some infractions. Look how closed her bite is. So I will tell you that if you just did veneers on this, they come flying off. And so this is Angela, and this is her smile afterwards. So this is the type of lab technician I have is that when I put a full mouth case, cause we worked it out in orthotic, this literally, and I'm not kidding you, this is the occlusion that I first check. So that's the kind you want. And this is Tom. I know Tom, my first cousin, worked for Anheuser-Busch internal auditing for, for 18 years. That was a typical tomorrow smile. My father had that same bite, his dad did too. He just wore the lip, but, He's now headed in for seven years. When he calls me, I'm just praying nothing's broke. <laughs> I'm kidding. And that's time. So one of the last thing I want to talk about, the important thing is, is that the appearance and attitude of you and your team, you know, the carpenter is the one person whose house needs the most work. But I will tell you, this is a dentist that was presenting cosmetic treatment for years. And finally, a patient said to them, I'll do my teeth when you do your teeth. That patient happened to be Lynn. This happened to be me. And I went from that to that 1996, 97, Dick Cheney all over. And so I will tell you that make sure that your house is in order. Make sure that you have the right smile when you're talking cosmetics to patient. One who works with their hands is said to be a laborer. One who works with their hands and mind is said to be a craftsman. One who works with their hands mind, heart is said to be an artist. This is by St. Francis Sissy. That's where we are as cosmetic dentists, as dentists who are healthcare providers. Even if you're not doing smile makeovers, put it in your heart, put it in your hand, your mind. Make sure your expression shows you love your work. So I just, every lecture I give, I go back to October 1st, 2017. Just, just terrible situation. 22,000 at the Harvest Fest. Uh, I dedicate all my lectures to this person, 58 dead, 500 injury. This is Nisha. She's our next door neighbor. She was our next door neighbor. She was one of the ones, unfortunately, didn't make it, the mother of three children. And so we became Vegas strong. But on those days where perhaps you don't have a crown that fits and you're feeling down, you know, we're all so privileged to be dentists. We really are in the dental profession. We have such an incredible profession. We have chosen the one of the most incredible professions there are and the opportunities we have so you know no matter what the situation is count your breath blessings and be thankful for those that have paid the price before us we have no right to complain on anything that we do from day to day i tried to make every day positive i had my down days i had my upset times i just want to thank everyone and let's go for some here's my Email, I ran a little bit late. Sorry, Lisa. One of the questions is uh, your thoughts on using the HIP and helping you determine the plane of occlusion. If you remember, and again, trying to do a two hour presentation on an eight hour subject minimum, um, it's the hamular uh, incisal papillae. That's a, neuro, a neuromuscular mounting. And obviously I was the clinic director at LVI for years. And I did a, re, a, a residency in a occlusion and CR. So I use a combination of neuromuscular and CR at times. But the question is, it is a valid way to mount models and to diagnose and to evaluate occlusion. Uh, you have to have a lab technician or a dentist that is very much aware. 
But I do believe in the HIP. I think it, it shows a lot of occlusal issues the patient may have. So I do like that as, as one of the alternatives. And then another question is about myofunctional therapy. Again, the question that comes up is evaluation of the occlusion is truly, truly probably the number one uh, question about success of a case because you don't want to contribute to any occlusal pathology, none whatsoever. You just don't want to contribute to it. You want to make sure that you've addressed that happy RV, that you control the vertical height, the anterior poster. Please take the time to check out the occlusion. Uh, best materials for impressions. You know, nowadays, impression materials, I don't know what percentage decrease. I still use a lot of impression materials. And we also scan a lot, too. So there's a lot of good polyvinyl. I love the imprint polyether, but also I like the imprint too. Uh, Panacil is another good impression material by Kettenbach. And Voco has, they, they, there's a lot of good impression materials. One of the things you want to make sure is that this impression material, that one of the biggest failures in the dental lab is when a doctor takes a quick set and makes it with a regular set. In every one of our operatories, and I am a fanatic about timing things, but we make sure when I do a smile makeover, I use the four minute regular set and I use extra light body, but I make sure the time, the working time, the clinical time, the setting time are all the same. I don't use a quick set with a regular set. Also, don't mix different impression materials. Please don't do that. Don't mix just use the same light body that you do for tray material. Questions? Would you read them to me? Yeah, please? yep. So first question is, do you work at CR at all, at all times? If I'm doing a smile makeover, do I work at CR at all times? No. Yes, that's the question. No, no. Again, as I just shared with you, I did a residency in a closing. If I'm doing a smile makeover and just a smile makeover, it depends now if I'm doing a full mouth reconstruction, I'm gonna establish that plane of occlusion. I'm gonna establish the occlusal philosophy that I wanna use. Do I use CR? Do I use neuromuscular? I will tell you a lot of times, most times I use a little combination, but I will evaluate that with using orthotics. That's a whole different ball game than a smile makeover. Smile makeover, we're usually just doing the eight anterior teeth. So. Most of my smile, just smile makeovers, if the occlusion and the vertical and the AP is right, and I am controlling, you know, making sure there's no issues with parafunction habits, that, you know, there's no clinching and grinding that are excess, or if I need to, I will put those patients in guards afterwards. But if I make sure, the first thing I check is that shimbashi, and I make sure that I have enough height, I will work in CO. Okay, next question. Do you always use Scotch Bomb Plus when using Reliac self etching resin cement? I am very, very strict about using the same materials with the same cement. That is a huge, that can be, not always, that can be. You can use combinations, but I rather not cross manufacturing lines. And the reason for that is they have developed that cement with that bonding agent. Okay, and that's all we have right now. Okay, again, everyone, here's my email address and my phone number. Um, it was a lot of material, but we got through it and it gives you a little taste of what's possible. Please don't hesitate to call us, call me and or email me and any questions or anything I can have you help you with or Again, maybe something I can learn from as well. Oh, so, you know, we one more question just popped, yeah. popped in. When do you do no prep veneers? When do I do no prep veneers? Well, my definition of a no prep veneer is to slightly reduce the enamel. When I do a no prep veneer is if I have a very young patient that I can't do composites on, or uh, for instance, it's a patient that perhaps a, uh, a fluorosis or a tetracycline, or there's something on the enamel defect 
in a young patient, usually an adult, that I just want to uh, clean that enamel up and give them a smile makeover. So that's the time that I do the very conservative no prep. My no prep is still a slight brushing of the enamel so that I can establish a good margin. Now, the reason I say that is one of the biggest issues with no prep veneers is the lip and pushing the lip out. So I'm very conscious because when I've done many no, or no prep veneer, one of the complaints I get is, you know, I really am uncomfortable with my lip. But in the right situation, if the, depending on the occlusion, on the arch contour, we can do a, what I would call, I refer to it as a minimum, minimum, minimum prep veneer. Okay. I'm not big on certain products that you just, you know, that, Again, I like using Empress in the anterior. Um, I've used Feldspathic, but that's my material to go to. You have to be very, I think my own conclusion is you have to be very careful when you go to a no prep. There are situations and you have to be very selective in that. Okay, and then one final question. Yeah. Does opening the contacts make it more likely that the veneers will fit next to each other as opposed to one of the veneers being pushed out of line when you don't break contact? I love that question. That's a great question. When I go to try my veneers on, I want a positive seat. And it's so much easier for my lab technician to give me ideal contacts. Because as you know, when, when, when I have used them, and it's still when I do use them, and I do, when I don't break the contact, it's almost like you have a surf, you're surfing a little bit to find that position sometimes. You can establish a nice margin, nice chamfer margin. And, but yet sometimes it, it just, when you go to bond, I go, oh, please, God, please help me make sure I get this in the right place. Whereas if I have a nice contact broken with a nice, shoulder chamfer. That's what I call it. Chamfer, shoulder, shoulder chamfer. I have a positive seat in that. That's a great question. I love that question. Uh, then a follow-up to that question was, so how much space between the openness of the contacts do you establish? Well, I break the contact. So I want to be very conservative. So I always tell the patient, they always ask me, how much tooth reduction are you going to have on my teeth. I mean, they asked me, are you going to whittle my teeth down? Because a lot of patients still think about the days when we had PFMs, where all we did was we took them down one and a half millimeters. So what I tell them is I'm going to take enough just to get my lab technician to establish not only the beauty of the, your new crown or veneer, but also I usually tell them I usually don't reduce any more than three quarters of a millimeter all the way around. So my shoulder chamfer is usually about at the most a half a millimeter to a quarter of a millimeter. So I break that contact. And again, it depends. Every case is different. Are we closing a black triangle? What are we doing? Are we, do we have a deep, uh, a, a wide diastema? We're closing the diastema. And here's the rule of thumb. For every millimeter of a diastema you're closing, you should carry that margin interproximately down a half a millimeter. So if you have a two millimeter um, diastema, you should carry that down sub G a millimeter, every millimeter, half a millimeter sub G so that you have the proper emergence profile. Nothing drives me more nuts than when you're closing a diastema lab technician just come across like a square line so that you have proper emergence profile so that it looks like it's coming right out of the gum. So hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> okay, and that's it, Dr. Tomorrow. So we can go ahead and close it out. Okay. Thank you.